Where the Red Fern Grows, Chapter 19, Part B. Long after my mother and father had retired, I sat by the fire trying to think and couldn't. I felt numb all over. I knew my dog was dead, but I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to. One day they were both alive and happy. Then, that night, just like that, one of them was dead. I didn't know how long I had been sitting there when I heard a noise out on the porch. I got up and walked over to the door and listened. It came again, a low whimper and a scratchy sound. I could think of only one thing that could have made that noise. It had to be my dog. He wasn't dead. He'd come back to life. With a pounding heart, I opened the door and stepped out on the porch. What I saw was more than I could stand. The noise I had heard had been made by little Anne. All her life, she had slept by old Dan's side, and although he was dead, she had left the doghouse, had come back to the porch, and snuggled up close to his side. She looked up at me and whimpered. I couldn't stand it. I didn't know I was running until I tripped and fell. I got to my feet and ran on and on down through our fields of shocked corn until I fell face down on the river's bank. There in the gray shadows of a breaking dawn, I cried until I could cry no more. The churring of gray squirrels in the bright morning sun told me it was daylight. I got to my feet and walked back to the house. Coming up through our bond lot, I saw my father feeding our stock. He came over and said, Breakfast is about ready. I don't want any breakfast, Papa, I said. I'm not hungry and I have a job to do. I'll have to bury my dog. I'll tell you what, he said. I'm not going to be very busy today. So let's have a good breakfast and then I'll help you. No, Papa, I said. I'll take care of it. You go and eat breakfast. Tell Mama I'm not hungry. I saw a hurt look in my father's eyes. Shaking his head, he turned and walked away. From rough pine slabs, I made a box for my dog. It was a crude box, but it was the best I could do. With strips of burlap and corn shucks, I padded the inside. Up on the hillside, at the foot of a beautiful red oak tree, I dug his grave. There, where the wild mountain flowers would grow in the spring, I laid him away. I had a purpose in burying my dog up there on the hillside. It was a beautiful spot. From there, one could see the country for miles. The long, white, crooked line of the river, the tall, thick timber of the bottoms, the sycamores, birch, and box elder. I thought, perhaps, on moonlight nights, Old Dan would be able to hear the deep voices of the hounds as they rolled out over the river bottoms on the frosty air. After the last shovel full of dirt was padded in place, I sat down and let my mind drift back through the years. I thought of the old KC baking powder can and the first time I saw my pups in the box at the depot. I thought of the $50, the nickels and dimes, and the fishermen and the blackberry patches. I looked at his grave, and with tears in my eyes, I voiced these words. You were worth it, old friend, and a thousand times over. In my heart, I knew that there in that grave lay a man's best friend. Two days later, when I came from the bottoms where my father and I were clearing land, my mother said, Billy, you better look after your dog. She won't eat. I started looking for her. I went to the barn, the corn crib, looked under the porch. I called her name. It was no use. I rounded up my sisters and asked if they'd seen little Anne. The youngest one said she'd seen her go down into the garden. I went there calling her name. She wouldn't answer my call. I was about to give up, then I saw her. She had wiggled her way far back under the thorny limbs of a blackberry bush in the corner of the garden. I talked to her and tried to coax her out. She wouldn't budge. I got down on my knees and crawled back to her. 
As I did, she raised her head and looked at me. Her eyes told the story. They weren't the soft gray eyes I'd looked into so many times. They were dull and cloudy. There was no fire, no life. I couldn't understand. I carried her back to the house. I offered her food and water. She wouldn't touch it. I noticed how lifeless she was. I thought perhaps she had a wound I had overlooked. I felt and probed with my fingers. I could find nothing. My father came and looked at her. He shook his head and said, Billy, it's no use. The life has gone out of her. She has no will to live. He turned and walked away. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. With eggs and rich cream, I made a liquid, pried her mouth open and poured it down. She responded to nothing I did. I carried her to the porch and laid her in the same place I laid the body of old Dan. I covered her with gunny sacks. All through the night, I would get up and check on her. Next morning, I took warm, fresh milk, and again, I opened her mouth and fed her. It was a miserable day for me. At noon, it was the same. My dog had just given up. There was no will to live. That evening, when I came in from the fields, she was gone. I hurried to my mother. Mama told me she had seen her go up the hollow from the house, so weak she could hardly stand. Mama had watched her until she had disappeared in the timber. I hurried up the hollow, calling her name. I called and called. I went up to the head of it, still calling her name and praying she would come to me. I climbed out onto the flats, looking, searching, and calling. It was no use. My dog was gone. I had thought a ray of hope. I just knew I'd find her at the grave of old Dan. I hurried there. I found her lying on her stomach, her hind legs stretched out straight, and her front feet folded back under her chest. She had laid her head on his grave. I saw the trail where she had dragged herself through the leaves. The way she lay there, I thought she was alive. I called her name. She made no movement. With the last ounce of strength in her body, she had dragged herself to the grave of old Dan. Kneeling down by her side, I reached out and touched her. There was no response, no whimpering cry or friendly wag of her tail. My little dog was dead. I laid her head in my lap and with tear-filled eyes gazed up into the heavens. In a choking voice, I asked, Why did they have to die? Why must I hurt so? What have I done wrong? I heard a noise behind me. It was my mother. She sat down and put her arm around me. You've done no wrong, Billy, she said. I know this seems terrible, and I know how it hurts. But at one time or another, everyone suffers. Even the good Lord suffered when he was here on earth. I know, Mama, I said, but I can't understand. It was bad enough when old Dan died. Now little Anne is gone. Both of them gone, just like that. Billy, you haven't lost your dogs altogether, Mama said. You'll always have their memory. Besides, you can have some more dogs. I rebelled at this. I don't want any more dogs, I said. I won't ever want another dog. They wouldn't be like old Dan and little Anne. We all feel that way, Billy, she said. I do especially. They fulfilled a prayer that I thought would never be answered. I don't believe in prayer anymore, I said. I prayed for my dogs, and look, both of them are dead. Mama was silent for a moment. Then, in a gentle voice, she said, Billy, Sometimes it's hard to believe that things like this can happen, but there's always an answer. When you're older, you'll understand better. No, I won't, I said. 
I don't care if I'm a hundred years old. I'll never understand why my dogs had to die. As if she was talking to someone far away, I heard her say in a low voice, I don't know what to say. I can't seem to find the right words. Looking up at her face, I saw her eyes were flooded with tears. Mama, please don't cry, I said. I didn't mean what I said. I know you didn't, she said, as she squeezed me up tight. It's just your way of fighting back. I heard the voice of my father calling to us from the house. Come now, Mama said. I have supper ready and your father wants to talk to you. I think when you've heard what he has to say, you'll feel better. I can't leave little land like this, Mama, I said. It'll be cold tonight. I think I'll carry her back to the house. No, I don't think you should do that, Mama said. Your sisters would go all to pieces. Let's make her comfortable here. Raking some leaves into a pile, she picked little Anne up and laid her on them. Taking off my coat, I spread it over her body. I dreaded to think of what I had to do on the morrow. My father and sisters were waiting for us on the porch. Mama told them the sad story. My sisters broke down and started crying. They ran to Mama and buried their faces in her long cotton dress. Papa came over and laid his hand on my shoulder. Billy, he said, there are times in a boy's life when he has to stand up like a man. This is one of those times. I know what you're going through and how it hurts, but there's always an answer. The good Lord has a reason for everything he does. There couldn't be any reason for my dogs to die, Papa, I said. There just couldn't. They hadn't done anything wrong. Papa glanced at Mama. Getting no help for her, he said, It's getting cold out here. Let's go in the house. I have something to show you. Guess what we're having for supper, Mama said as we turned to enter the house. Your favorite, Billy, sweet potato pie. You'll like that, won't you? I nodded my head, but my heart wasn't in it. Papa followed us in the kitchen. He turned and entered his bedroom. When he came into the room, he had a small shoebox in his hand. I recognized the box by the bright blue ribbon tied around it. Mama kept her valuables in it. A silence settled over the room. Walking to the head of the table, Papa set the box down and started untying the ribbon. His hands were trembling as he fumbled with the knot. With the lid off, he reached in and started lifting out bundles of money. After stacking them in a neat pile, he raised his head and looked straight at me. Billy, he said, you know how your mother has prayed that someday we'd have enough money to move out of these hills and into town so that you children could get an education. I nodded my head. Well, he said in a low voice, because of your dogs, her prayers have been answered. This is the money earned by old Dan and little Ann. I've managed to make the farm feed us and clothe us, and I've saved every cent your furs brought in. We now have enough. Isn't it wonderful, Mama said. It's just like a miracle. I think it is a miracle, Papa said. Remember, Billy said a prayer when he asked for his pups, and then there were your prayers. Billy got his pups through those dogs. Your prayers were answered. Yes, I'm sure it is a miracle. If he gave them to me, then why did he take them away, I asked. I think there's an answer for that, too, Papa said. You see, Billy, your mother and I had decided not to separate you from your dogs. We knew how much you loved them. We decided that when we moved to town, we'd leave you here with your grandpa for a while. He needs help anyway. But I guess the good Lord didn't want that to happen. He doesn't like to see family split up. That's why they were taken away. I knew my father was a firm believer in fate. 
To him, everything that happened was the will of God, and in his Bible, he could always find the answers. Papa could see that his talk had had very little effect on me. With a sorrowful look on his face, he sat down and said, Now, let us give thanks for our food and for all the wonderful things God has done for us. I'll say a special prayer and ask him to help Billy. I barely heard what Papa had to say. During the meal, I could tell that no one was enjoying the food. As soon as it was over, I went to my room and lay down on the bed. Mama came in. Why don't you go to bed, she said, and get a good night's sleep. You'll feel better tomorrow. No, I won't, Mama, I said. I'll have to bury little Ann tomorrow. I know, she said, and she turned my covers down. I'll help if you want me to. No, Mama, I said. I don't want anyone to help. I'd rather do it all by myself. Billy, you're always doing things by yourself, Mama said. That's not right. Everyone needs help sometime in his life. I know, Mama, I said, but please, not this time. Ever since my dogs were puppies, we've always been together, just us three. We hunted together and played together. We even went swimming together. Did you know, Mama, that little Ann used to come every night and peek in my window just to see if I was all right? I guess that's why I want to be by myself when I bury her. Now say your prayers and go to sleep. I'm sure you'll feel better in the morning. I didn't feel like saying any prayers that night. I was hurting too much. Long after the rest of the family had gone to bed, I lay staring into the darkness, trying to think and not able to. Sometime in the night, I got up and tiptoed to my window and looked out at my doghouse. It looked so lonely and empty sitting there in the moonlight. I could see that the door was slightly ajar. I thought of the many times I had lain in my bed and listened to the squeaking of the door as my dogs went in and out. I didn't know I was crying until I felt the tears roll down my cheek. Mama must have heard me get up. She came in and put her arms around me. Billy, she said in a quavering voice, you'll just have to stop this. You're going to make yourself sick, and I don't think I can stand any more of it. I can't, Mama, I said. It hurts so much. I just can't. I don't want you to feel bad just because I do. I can't help it, Billy, she said. Come now and get back in bed. I'm afraid you'll catch cold. After she had tucked me in, she sat on the bed for a while. As if she were talking to the darkness, I heard her say, If only there was some way I could help, something I could do. No one can help, Mama, I said. No one can bring my dogs back. I know, she said as she got up to leave the room. But there must be something. There just has to be. After Mama had left the room, I buried my face in my pillow and cried myself to sleep. The next morning, I made another box. It was smaller than the first one. Each nail I drove in the rough pine boards caused the knot in my throat to get bigger and bigger. My sisters came to help. They stood it for a while, and then with tears streaming, they ran from the house. I buried little Ann by the side of old Dan. I knew that was where she wanted to be. I also buried a part of my life along with my dog. Remembering a sandstone ledge I'd seen while prowling the woods, I went there. I picked out a nice stone and carried it back to the graves. There, with painstaking care, I carved their names deep in its red surface. As I stood looking at the two graves, I tried hard to understand some of the things my father had told me, but I, I couldn't. I was still hurting and still had that empty feeling. I went to Mama and had a talk with her. Mama, I asked, do you think God made a heaven for all good dogs? Yes, she said. I'm sure he did. Do you think he made a place for dogs to hunt? You know, just like we have here on our place with mountains and sycamore trees, rivers and cornfields and old rail fences. Do you think he did? From what I've read in the good book, Billy, she said, he put far more things up there than we have here. Yes, I'm sure he did. I was thinking this over when Mama came up to me and started tucking my shirt in. Do you feel better now? she asked. 
It still hurts, Mama, I said, as I buried my face in her dress. But I do feel a little better. I'm glad, she said as she patted my head. I don't like to see my little boy hurt like this.